excited with uh, introducing Liz. It's a huge pleasure for me to be here to introduce so Liz, who is a um, colleague and also a friend, but I'll try to keep this very professional. <laughs> um, so she's currently a professor of STEM education. I didn't know that, actually, STEM education at the, Metro, Metro, at the Manchester Metropolitan University. And um, she's also amazingly at the same time a professor at Adelphi University. So she's doing two jobs at the same time. Um, and before that, she was at the University of Prince Edward Island and uh, did her degree at the University of Toronto. Um, and uh, in addition to a lot of uh, incredible work in uh, math education and in philosophy of uh, mathematics also, she's an accomplished novelist. Um, and uh, she's uh, interested in lots of different things in addition to sort of these philosophical investigations, um, interested in, in embodiment and sensation, um, interested in some of the biosocial stuff that we started thinking about last uh, month, and actually that's what she's going to talk to us about uh, today. And uh, she's got a couple books, including one that is very, very good called Backbatics in the Body. <laughs> and, uh, um, and some, uh, I think she's been in the past week giving a talk at Columbia, and then giving a talk in Philadelphia, and then she's going to MSU. So we're very lucky that she managed to do this detour to the West Coast to come and be with us today. And if you haven't been to these presentations before, the format is that she's going to speak um, like the normal way, and there'll be some questions for the audience, and then we'll take a short break. And then the students who are enrolled in this uh, extraordinary course uh, will conduct an interview, and we're all welcome to be to stay here and, and, and um, participate in, in that interview. And uh, we end up finishing around 4 o'clock, and there's some um, sweets there to keep you going if you run out of steam to the end. So, Okay, yes, it works. Great. All right, um, I'm going to sit down. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm really pleased to be here, really honored to get this chance to come and talk and um, spend a whole afternoon talking and learning about um, what's been going on in the course. And I hope that what I prepared for today uh, resonates and um, can link up maybe with some of the thinking that some of you are doing around uh, new materiality. So uh, the title of the talk is uh, Calculating Matter and Worldly Sensibility. And uh, the paper focuses on the role of digital sensor technology in our everyday life, um, more specifically the role of technology in our theories of learning and behavior. Um, sensor technologies are increasingly embedded in buildings to track movement, sound and temperature in smart buildings all over the place, as well as being embedded in persons um, to monitor heart rate, electrodermal activity, eye tracking, what have you. And I'm interested in um, whether or to what extent this new digital situation calls for a new materialist theoretical framework of some kind to help us grapple with the digital life um, that uh, Facebook and others know that we live. Um, so in order to pursue this aim, um, I draw quite extensively on in this presentation on a set of uh, theorists, and I thought it would be helpful just to show them right up front since I really do owe a great deal to them. Um, so the work of Mark Hansen, Elizabeth Wilson, and John Protevi are really the theorists that I try to weave together in interesting ways because there's quite a few tensions between these three. I also follow Deborah, Deborah Lepton's um, work who defines the term sensor technology as technologies that produce sensory t data about the body or the environment, so a very broad definition. Um, as Don Nafis suggests in her book of 2016, keeping this term biosensor broad allows us to consider the political impact of this kind of data. Um, and my presentation today is going to focus on uh, wearable biosensors that are commonly used to tap the human body for physiological biodata. Uh, wearable sensor technology is now commonly common way of collecting data from the human body 
um, mostly, of course, um, on the skin wearable. Um, so here I focus on bracelets, which are said to offer clinical quality observation and monitoring of temperature, movement, blood volume, pulse, um, and um, electrodermal activity and various other things. I'm going to discuss in particular one such bracelet produced by a company called Impatica, um, a, a company that focuses on what they call affective computing and data analytics. Empatica designs and sells wearable di digital devices, um, serving hospitals, research organizations. They're out of MIT, um, but they sell all over the world, including universities and wherever people are interested in biometric data. And I'm focusing in particular on how these bracelets track the EDA, the electrodermal activity, and the implications for theories of learning and um, of um, education. So I argue that such technical intrusions produce evidence of a worldly and more than human sensibility. So my attempt really here is to try and recast digital biodata as part of the ecological study of complex dynamic systems and atmospheric media. So it's, um, it's a difficult argument I think I'm trying to make, but I'm, I'm going to see how well it goes over today. Um, my interest is in how this kind of data might be understood within education, and I argue that electrodermal data um, belong to the charged learning environment. So it's an attempt to kind of displace the data from the body and think about it as environmental data. And my approach moves away from theories of agent-centered perceptual synthesis, which is usually how we use this data in, a, in learning theories and in education. So rather than thinking of it as um, evidence of how human bodies are uh, perceiving. Instead, I want to think about it in terms of a sensory digital milieu. So the primary aim of the talk will be in the area of conceptual development um, around this kind of computational um, biosocial research that's going on um, quite extensively in education. And specifically, my aim is to show how biosensor data might serve in further developing post-human theories of learning. So um, perhaps the bigger picture, though, for me, uh, is the question of whether digital biosensor data um, demands that we think, rethink the relationship between the qualitative and the quantitative. So this is something that I'm really interested in. A lot of my work goes to the questions of what a philosophy of um, life might be that actually can accommodate a concept of the quantitative that doesn't seem to work against life. So quantification of life at scales well below the human suggests a strange new world of immersive measure all sorts of people um, are writing about this kind of um, embedded measurement. And much of my work is generally inter interested in how we can attend to the relationship between measure and matter. So perhaps for this seminar, I guess I'm wondering how to think about measure through new materialisms. You know, what is, you know, how, how can we do this in, in politically interesting and important ways? And I'm reminded um, in that sense that of uh, Vicki Kirby's work and Karen Barad's work um, and those, how those two scholars have talked about, uh, quote, invest the, the world investigating itself mathematically. You know, so what exactly does that mean for new materialists like Vicki Kirby and Karen Barad? Um, and what does it mean when someone like Karen Barad says that animate and inanimate creatures do not merely embody mathematical theories, they do mathematics? Um, so the bigger picture for me in this talk is how to theorize a calculating matter that is not reductive um, or mechanistic, let's say, and how to imagine a qual-quant mis mixture that is charged with uh, uh, generative potential and capable of uh, bringing forth the new in some way. So there's enigmatic links um, to, to people like Gregory Chaitin and Stephen Wolfram, you can, if some of you are familiar with their work, this kind of idea that the world is computational. I really have a very different philosophical take on um, this pursuit, but there's interesting intersections. So um, just to show you, hopefully this, well, I don't know how scary an image like this is to some. Some people apparently find this quite beautiful. Um, but anyway, so um, biotechnologies, so biopedagogies. Um, so many contemporary applications of sensor technologies in education research are harnessed to highly conventional and reductionist models of learning conceived in terms of faster or more effective transit through predefined stages. So how well you can you move along to what your target is? And biotechnologies and biopedagogies are being used with children and adults to track and modify attention and engagement, decision-making, emotional states. 
creativity, what have you. So I'm quite sensitive to the fact that um, any kind of affirmation of the force of the, of the uh, digital and biochemical without adequate critique, um, as sometimes found in current work in this area, um, needs to be interrogated. And indeed, I'm also conscious of how a lot of interdisciplinary projects that bring the biological and the social together end up being very biocentric. And this is something that someone like Des Fitzgerald and probably um, Deborah Udell spoke about that, I, I hope, anyway, um, last time. So um, moreover, the sensor technologies that are central to this kind of research simply carry serious ethical implications as they permit new levels of intervention into the bodies, the mental states, and the conduct of um, our students. Um, so behavior interventions are typically grounded in normative assumptions based on control or correction of bodily phenomena that irritate dominant notions of proper conduct. So children who are too fidgeting, who have ADHD, repetitive gestures, noisy, what have you. Deployments of biotechnologies to track this kind of behavior are easily and often rightly critiqued on ethical and pedagogical grounds as serving a nightmare image of the control society. It's also important, however, to move beyond the agonistics of critique and towards creative experimentation and the development of new theory. These devices offer opportunity for new insight, not least in that they allow us to attend capacities that are often overlooked or poorly understood in conventional educational research. Biodata in itself could support different kinds of explorations that actually could um, use concepts of emergence, threshold, affective intensity, and creative experimentation around the aesthetic dimensions of learning environments, tracking and tracing aspects um, affect and sensation that um, conventional uh, qualitative research methods and quantitative research methods just simply cannot um, or rather fail to encounter. So someone like uh, Nicholas Rose, who uh, might be familiar to some of you, has talked about a really positive paradigm shift that could um, re-engage the social and the um, biological, a kind of affirmative relationship with um, a new non-reductive biology. So this kind of language and this kind of discussion is, um, is afloat. And it's really quite important, I think, and notable that the, this rapprochement between the biological and the social is occurring at a very particular historical moment when biology itself is undergoing significant change as it becomes increasingly computational itself and comp increasingly data-driven. So what some have called biology 3.0 um, aims to operate without the biological digital divide, um, merging wet and informatic um, perspectives and approaches into one all-encompassing scientific practice. So biology itself is really undergoing a transformation, so it's quite interesting to think about why this is happening now in, across the social sciences. So with that in mind, my hope is to contribute to discussions about how to fashion a bioethics adequate to 21st century um, new digital technologies and new empiricisms. Um, by reclaiming the biodata that all too often is used to pathologize the individual human body. And I argue that digital microsensors produce evidence of a more than human worldly sensibility. So I'm actually trying to see the digital not as enemy, but somehow as part of that worldly sensibility. So this th theoretical reframing of biodata is an important step in addressing some of the political concerns associated with the biosocial subject that Claire Colebrook and some others have raised. So in pursuing this pro project, I hasten to remind readers that the term biosocial recalls previous misuses of biological sciences and it's certainly the attention to the environment, so trying to kind of look at and this is through an environmental lens, does not make it um, innocent by any stretch of the imagination. So you have a book like um, um, The Welfare Trade coming out, um, I think last year, uh, which um, really pursues a similar kind of environmental argument and yet um, with really complicated political implications for what um, this professor is, is claiming in terms of breeding welfare experiences out of, um, out of, out of people's lives. So we have to keep these kind of historical but also obviously contemporary links in mind as we consider possible merging, merging of um, biology and the social sciences. Um, so avoiding techno-fantasies, whether they're dystopic or utopian, um, 
my project here is to try and um, you know, create some new imaginings about the potential use um, and um, hopefully um, the, the ethical use of this kind of stuff in education research. So to that end, um, I'm going to argue that um, digital biodata can be studied as part of the charged learning environment as an expression of collective affect and as generative of the new during phase shift events. And I offer an argument as to why social science researchers might reclaim and repurpose sensory digital plugins, subverting the interests of the control state by showing how such data actually points to the profoundly relational and materially distributed nature of learning. So this approach troubles um, the very idea of the organism as the unit of inquiry and thus differs from related epigenetic research, which continues, in my opinion, to focus on the organism insofar as it um, responds to the environment, so through um, regulation of gene expression. So in so doing, I hope to trouble some of the assumptions of uh, the organism or organicism found in current epigenetic research, which treats the social as signal and continues to operate with a single causal arrow um, between the environment and organism, um, albeit granting important emphasis to the environment. So rather than claim that the environment becomes embodied in the epigenome, and rather than focus on trauma and pathology, which is what um, Maurizio Milani, who's done the hi history of this kind of research, has pointed out that most epigenetic research really does still focus on trauma and pathology. So rather than do these, these this, have this kind of um, built-in um, agenda, um, I really want to try and read biodata as part of the radical exteriority of experience, so as evidence of the inhuman forces at play in any milieu. And this approach takes up the notion of the signal quite differently, drawing on the work of um, media theorist Mark Hansen, who studies the inherent technicity of matter and life, emphasizing how digital media actually sense and actuate below um, the time scale of the human. Hansen argues um, that digital biosensors plug into a worldly sensibility and suggests that these new digital intrusions are able to access primordial sensibility, he calls it. And they, they quote unquote, enjoy a sensory domain all their own. So according to this approach, new mobile media can be studied less as cyborgian extensions of human faculties and more as registering the environmentability of the world. And to the extent that digital sensors are not mimicking or magnetic magnifying human perceptual organs. So to the extent that they are instead expanding the distribution of some kind of more than human sensation, this is, seems a valid point to me. Um, I think uh, it seems to entail what Hansen calls a media-driven transformation of human experience itself um, through this sort of um, odd computational culture that we're immersed in and thus moves from an agent-centered perceptual modality to an environmental sensibility. So sensor data at micro scales forces us to imagine life quite differently and to seek the inorganic potentialities and the inhuman forces by which a body can, as Colebrook says, branch out into territories beyond its own self-maintenance. And my interest is in how this approach might help us to think about learning theory differently and how it might direct our attention to the trans-individual aspect of learning so central to my argument is um, that the biosensors are not operating prosthetically um, because they engage with the body in a more distributed and an unconscious way. And so thus they have no correlate to the usual embodied organs, but instead seem to transcend, transcend the very notion of organism while still mobilizing somehow embodied forces. So the in the case studies that I'm looking at um, pertain to, um, again, some more scary pictures. I chose these pictures. I knew they, I hoped they would scare you, actually, because the bracelet I'm discussing is the black one. It's um, the Empatica bracelet. But a lot of these different kinds of devices are on the market. You can buy them quite easily. And um, the, white, the two white bracelets I found on a website um, for, from another company, and I just thought it was so disturbing that this, you know, this female hand with a, merit, with a wedding ring um, was shackled to this other uh, anklet um, of an infant. Um, anyway, okay, so the, the Empatica E4 wristband, um, 
is um, designed to record continuous real-time data during waking or sleeping hours. It contains a three-axis accelerometer that tracks motion, an infrared thermopile to track temperature, um, a photoplasmography sensor that does the blood volume pulse, but um, from which heart rate and other kinds of um, heart rate variability and other cardiovascular features can be derived. And it also contains electrodermal activity sensor, so EDA. <coughs> and this is said to, to quote unquote, it's used to measure sympathetic nervous system arousal and to derive features related to stress, engagement, and excitement. So it's particularly the EDA that I'm going to focus on and how it gets used. Um, so the Affective Computing Lab at MIT uses these bracelets in a multitude of projects to study skin conductance associated with stressful activity um, and tracks the variability in how people express stress, they say. And it's important to mention here that tons of really important work goes on at this lab, um, helping people, um, especially with epilepsy um, with, and with other kinds of seizure problems. Um, but the projects I'm discussing today here um, are projects that come out of that lab as well, but that, they're, that are focused on learning. So these projects are entirely focused on how EDA data is the expression of affect possessed by an individual human body. In addition, projects affiliated with the lab that are focused on learning assume that such data underscores the cognitive achievements of an individual body. So one such project studies children as they play with Lego blocks, and uh, researchers have claimed that um, the wrist EDA sensor shows that, um, quote unquote, children are excited to take on new responsibilities, but are then quickly discouraged when they aren't given the resources to succeed, end of quote, in case you had doubted that observation. Um, so they also claim, perhaps more interestingly, that children um, don't always recognize their own achievements based on the EDA data. So in other words, the research suggests that skin conductance is a better or more accurate way of determining when children have accomplished something, rather than facial expression or verbal or other um, visible activity, so, and that there's a disconnect between these kinds of data. So that's a really dangerous and intriguing thing to claim. Now, the aim of the LEGO project is uncritically industry-oriented, um, as the researchers claim that um, by using skin conductance sensors, we can help companies better understand the unique perspective of children and build experiences fit for them. And that's a quote. Um, so this research thus explicitly is explicitly invested in using EDA data to serve corporate interests. And they redesign and personalize learning experiences that maximize the individual child's affective engagement, as well as their accurate evaluation of their own embodied actions. So these aims together reveal how so much of the EDA research inspired by and emerging out of MIT um, is based on a desire to correlate and also um, control the degree of intensity in any learning experience and to cultivate self-regulation of affect in children. So at Empath, a company that uses the Empatica bracelets to pursue um, empathic design through rigorous research, EDA is used to show when people are excited or unexcited or, um, or engaged or disengaged or stressed or what have you. Um, in learning experiments, the data is typically used to show when affect interferes with or supports a goal of some kind. So um, Empath interprets fluctuation in skin conductance as evidence of stress when, for instance, the EDA graph shows a series of um, hills and um, troughs during an experiment. So they interpret large spikes as um, uh, you know, high stress, usually, or um, severe anxiety. So in the, uh, in the figure here um, from their data report, um, EDA data from a child is shown while he uses some building blocks with his mother. So the EDA data is said to correlate with two possible scenarios. Um, so you can see um, the, the track of the yellow track going down. Um, the first, um, so the two, sorry, yeah, the first tracks, so, uh, sorry, this image either is an example or an image of positive excitement occurring over an event or um, negative anxiety occurring over an event. So these two interpretations underscore the inherent ambivalence of this data. Um, so the first interpretation says that as the child watches, um, um, so the, so the, sorry, the first part of the event, he's watching his mother work with the, 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 the cubes, and then he takes over himself. So in the first case, the following graph marks the boredom of a child as he watches his mother build a block toy, followed by the positive excitement and fluctuation when the child works independently, or two, 
Um, perhaps the first part marks the calmness of the child while he watches his mother build a block toy, followed by the negative stress and fluctuation when he anxiously builds independently. So the data does not definitively indicate one or the other. And this is really important. Um, although the researchers state that the boy Mason slouches and begins chatting about the blocks, losing interest when his mother is working with them. So, um, so something about this ambivalence, I think, is really key, sort of crucial for how we should be thinking about it. Um, the main textbook on EDA research was written in 1992 by Buxian with a second edition in 2012 because so many people are interested in this now. So despite the widespread use of such data, um, electrodermal phenomena are still not fully understood. Electrodermal experiments with humans and animals have a long and very checkered history, including horrific public displays of the power of electricity to shock animals into submission or death, and of course many discredited liar detection devices and other experimental instruments said to determine whether someone is telling the truth. Um, so tracking the scientific interest in the electric body over many centuries, Bertucci and Bencaldi have kind of given us a lot of examples of um, uh, within medicine of how this can always go astray. Um, this 1792 um, text uh, from Galvani could be considered the sort of first uh, introduction to electrophysiology. So, but even before this publication, um, during the mid-18th century, there's been a lot of um, use of electricity with the body. So we have to kind of think about this history. And I mentioned this history very importantly so that we situate our current developments and our current interest within this ongoing interest. Um, in the West, in the electric body. So, um, keeping this history, this very checkered history in mind, how might we make sense of the EDA data through um, today that we're, that we're seeing be, because it's being used? So how do we make sense of it? So through these, um, these electrodermal devices, they tap the electric body without violent intervention. In this case, as they say, passively collecting data about um, the electrophysiology of the organic body. And I suggest that EDA data is not evidence of an emotion of, or, or affect possessed by the human, but that skin conductance can be studied as evidence of the transitive, relational, and event nature of activity. So <clears throat> EDA data is profoundly indeterminate and thereby refuses to belong to any one organism while contributing to an unequally distributed environmental sensibility. This perspective underscores the need to rethink embodiment and the need to introduce a more porous and less self-referential conception of embodiment, a conception that understands the body to be a society of microsensibilities themselves, directly and atomically susceptible to technical capture. EDA data from E4 bracelets is purely differential, insofar as it marks a gradient or a rate of change rather than a definitive quantity that correlates with a particular um, affect. Measures of electrodermal data track changes in electrical skin conductance. It's these changes that are linked to the skin's production of sweat, which is itself linked to the sympathetic nervous system. Researchers distinguish between phasic data and lo with um, lots of peaks that seem to mark arousal and tonic data that record gradual changes in engagement. So this is just a purely conventional um, set of terms to help them um, distinguish these two kinds of experiences. The fact that there, are all, that there is always this differential element in, um, to the electric body helps us theorize the body as charged, but never static or still. Bodies are related rates of change, each rate itself changing. It's a change of a change of a change. This is sort of an nth derivative perspective on, on what the body is. So the peripheral nervous system extending the body into its frayed periphery carries this charge in nonstop differentiated flows. It's as if individuation of a body is a massive related rate problem. Electrodermal activity points to the different speeds of a becoming and the articulation of bodies as relations or ratios of speed and rest. Attending to the electromagnetic field as that which sustains a body, we can begin to study the provisionality of these and the microtemporalities of our boundedness. And in this vein, the data testifies to worldly sensibility, to a kind of provisional boundedness attending to the collective nature of becoming. So these EDA um, devices help us track the provisional nature of our experiences, but they also um, point to the differentiated nature of individuation, so how bodies come into being. 
So I'm interested in the way that EDA data points to alliances that are formed between internal organic processes and more distributed processes. Because it may not well be that affects and nerves and cells and skins and cilia um, and buildings and what have you are interactively connected in just the way um, speculative bio biology 3.0 suggests. So rather than dismiss EDA data as irrelevant or insignificant or misuse it um, because um, it seems to be pursuing only um, to pathologize learners. I want to trouble the all too easy anti-biologisms of social theory and explore the entanglements of biochemistry, ecology, and learning. And so my focus is on skin sorry, my focus on skin conductance is a way of attending to the neurological periphery, the far-flung electrical activity of the body, rather than what is assumed to be the center and administrator of that system, the brain. So following Elizabeth Wilson, I am less interested in the central nervous system than in the distributed network of nerves that innervate the periphery, as she says. Um, this electrical charge that innervates the skin is at the periphery, but Wilson argues that it plays a hugely significant role in rumination, in deliberation, in comprehension, and in all sorts of other things. And the challenge is how to engage with the EDA data without, on the one hand, simply acquiescing to the claim that biodata provides a factual foundation for simplistic measures of achievement, while on the other hand, trying to avoid repeating the doxa of social constructivism that simply dismisses, dismisses the data as irrelevant. So the EDA data is a testimony to the force of periphery activity, showing how the sympathetic nervous system is involved in intense personal agency. Wilson shows us how this peripheral nervous system actually occasionally dominates the central nervous system in the transmission and distribution of crucial biochemical compounds, such as adrenaline and serotonin. She argues that, um, that social theory should become more biochemically literate to reconsider the relational force of pharmaceuticals, metabolism, and the capacity of biological substances. And she argues that we must no longer treat the biological periphery as psychologically inert, nor treat biology itself as inflexible um, and an obstacle to politics. So investing in the speculative potential of matter, she uses, a recent, she uses recent work in physiology to argue that biological substance is as much phantasmatic substance as it is mechanistic. So accordingly, um, the so-called biological bedrock of the body is robust with fantastic capacities, a claim that I unpack a little differently in my own argument in this paper um, using some Deleuze ideas through John Protevi um, related to the virtual. Um, so the implications from Wilson's work and obviously from some of the other work I'm citing um, for, for learning theory, theory are obviously risky and uh, as they call for the existence, Wilson calls for the existence of organic thought, she calls it, and the biological unconscious. And these are concepts that have an awkward psychoanalytic history, um, but these are also concepts that help us problematize the conventional coding of such data in terms of cognitive achievement or as evidence of an all-controlling central nervous system. So really what, what I find through Wilson is she helps direct our attention to the dispersed nature, again, to the periphery and the provisionality of the boundedness. The skin sensors are one way to study this dispersed or dis distributed capacity. Indeed, skin occupies the quivering periphery of the bounded individual that we take to be the mark of the organism. The EDA skin data is thus perfect for showing how the bounded individual is always being broken down, disassembled, always being remade, intensified, always being charged. Rather than treat synapse and society as disjunctive and antagonistic, one can use this data as a way of tracking the blended world of the peripheral nervous system. At the juncture of the skin are, are, is a mixture of synapse and cilia and sweat and mind and society, all percolating. Such a reading of the data might be, as Wilson says, biological but non-localized chemical but non-deterministic, interior yet worldly. So I suggest that these um, chemical and electrical actions are a means of modulating worldly sensibility, of ruminating differently with the world and making the organic periphery tremble. The EDA data points to our biochemical relationality, our bioaffective dispersal. And my hope is to trigger new experiments in education um, in which the EDA data might be reconceived differently, not only in terms of biomarkers of personalized affect, but as evidence of 
this worldly sensibility. So in the spirit, might one turn to the, um, sorry, one might turn to the experiments of um, Noel, who, who in 2009 used EDA technology, who's a geographer and an artist in London. And he used the EDA technology to remap the effective shape of cities all over the world. Um, he created these 3D maps um, that combined conventional city maps uh, with graphical peaks and troughs of EDA data that had been produced by a whole bunch of volunteers. So this also involves um, rethinking the nature of digital biotechnology, not as an affordance or as a prosthetic extension, but more in terms of the technicity of matter itself. And so my approach actually considers technologies as somewhat indifferent to human interest and achievement in some sense, sort of participating in the environment firstly. So there's a kind of embedded philosophy of technology in here as well. So rather than demonize the technology as an extraction device that fails to capture lived experience, um, and clearly is probably well illustrated in some of these simplistic experiments that I showed you from the, the lab at MIT, um, I, my feeling is we need to, to, to find better ways to think about this new, these new kinds of digital plugins, um, different ways of understanding the significance of EDA data. So this involves theorizing the wristbands as a means of plugging into an environment a way of connecting with the machinic dimension and generative activity of the environment. So the concept of the virtual um, plays a really pivotal role here in my own argument. Um, <clears throat> and it was kind of interesting because to go now to Deleuze um, via John Protovi is problematic in many ways because Mark Hansen's work is, is very kind of, kind of perpendicular to Deleuze's work. But following um, Protovi's um, excellent book um, in 2013 on um, Life, and I can't remember the title of it, it was on the first slide, it's kind of a strange title. Um, but uh, what Protevi tries to do is he, he tries to use um, Deleuzean notions of the virtual and of intensive individuation um, to analyze various kinds of um, biological developments in the last um, century. So um, Deleuze ev elaborates a distinction between the actual and the virtual um, as part of his attempt to build a kind of pluralist ontology. Um, by thinking through the role of the virtual in this data, I believe we can begin to think differently about the capacity of matter. And this, I believe, is crucial in developing the bioethics that um, has clearly got to be part of this project. So Deleuze offers a new way of thinking about bodily capacity, less as an individuated possibility awaiting realization, achieving its um, um, given goal, and more as a live wire, a kind of differentiated field of charge. So a body's capacity is precisely this terrifying potential, this contraction and expansion of forces, this ongoing, unexpected worlding. Um, and according to this kind of approach then, perception is not an organized synthesis then of this body, um, but involves another differentiation of another differentiation. So Deleuze's through, you know, Protevi's through Deleuze, Deleuze is looking at differentiated flows. So Protevi argues that the virtual web of linked rates of change of, um, of neural and other material processes is what characterizes the sensory um, surround or confound. And crucial to this work is the fact that the relationship between the virtual and the actual um, is not one of resemblance. And so this is a very big part of Deleuze's project to kind of build a philosophy that uses the virtual very powerfully to avoid any, any suggestion of simplistic determination between the two. Um, so, uh, yeah, breaking the rule of resemblance so that the virtual doesn't resemble the actual, so that the virtual comes to sort of animate the actual or the real in unusual ways is a really big part of um, a project that's going to do justice to um, the potentiality of matter. But even if we manage to eliminate simplistic notions of resemblance, we're still faced with the usual assumption that this microsensory activity determines or causes um, the macro bodily activity, right? So the kind of biological determinism that we know is always at work um, in a lot of this research. So this notion of determination is at the heart of the dilemma, in my opinion, and um, concerns is really all, or probably our ultimate concern when we come to working with this kind of data. Um, so Protevi is very optimistic about how we could do this, again, using Deleuze's philosophy. And he argues that Deleuze's work resonates with um, the 4EA movement, which is uh, a movement in, uh, uh, in embodied cognition and uh, 
it, the four EA is this, four E's and one A, Emb embodied, embedded, enacted, extended, affective. So these are um, cognitive psychologists. So he's looking to sort of build bridges between philosophy and science and cognitive science and so on. So he looks at the, the four EA movement. Um, for, in my estimation, that um, those group of scholars are, are doing really interesting work, but there, there's something specific that I get out of Deleuze, and again, it's this return to the virtual and this, this philosophy of the virtual that I think is sort of more successful, I think, maybe, in um, rethinking the data. Um, and so, so I put determination as a question mark because I, just, because I think it's you know, kind of the source of the problem, but also maybe this, the, the direction that we need to dig into in order to um, reclaim this data in more interesting ways. So let me see how much more time have I got. Maybe 24, 5, 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think I should um, return to um, uh, this question of um, how the virtual could be um, thought about through the data. So. So this takes me back to um, Hansen. So again, I kind of go back and forth between Deleuze and Hansen somewhat uncomfortably, but um, I think that it's legit that I have them both in the same paper. So I'm willing to defend that. Um, so it may be that contemporary digital media of the biosensor kind um, modulate, um, as Hansen suggests, um, a kind of worldly sensibility directly. So not indirectly, but directly. Uh, without the human subject necessarily recruiting any value from this activity. Um, the humans are on the sidelines. Um, they may indeed be affected, and obviously they are, but indirectly because this new kind of digital technicity, argues Hansen, is simply better at plugging into a worldly, what he calls vibrational sensibility. So this, humans with their unwieldy organs simply are not as good at plugging into the vibrational sensibility that Hansen claims is sort of the virtual animacy of the world. Um, so again, though, how to grapple with this concept of uh, determinism and biological de determination. So Hansen suggests we study microsensory data for how it plugs into the futurity of matter. So somehow he thinks that what the digital is doing is it's sort of starting to kind of point to um, the futurity of matter, rather than looking backwards at the assumed to be complete event of sensation. So as the human who has completed sensation or finished perception and now reflects on it, um, he says, look instead to the way um, matter, um, what the, the, sort of the futural dimension of present matter. So how is the future actually animating the present matter that we think is what we're responding to? Um, how is the unscripted potential um, harbored in the virtual dimension of the matter that we are a part of? So rather than confine the causal efficacy of sensation to past conditions, so rather than think about um, children being um, having impact from playing with Lego or seeing their mother um, play with the Lego, um, try to reinterpret and reanalyze these kinds of learning events um, in terms of that futural matter that's at work somehow. So of course the issue is again how to avoid and resi to resist the controlling hand of predictive analytics, especially if we begin to talk about the future, um, while still affirming this futural capacity. So given how sensor data is already being used to control our futures, um, it seems urgent that we develop this theoretical and a practical approach to rethinking the nature of such data. And intensity um, becomes uh, a key concept, um, obviously for the researchers at MIT, but also for people who are trying to think about this stuff differently, like Mark Hansen. So thinking about intensity as a complex force, and the relationship between the concept of intensity and the virtual is a really interesting one. I'm not, I haven't figured it out exactly. These are both concepts that Deleuze likes to work with, um, and, um, but they, they have um, slightly different purposes in his project. So, um, but for Hansen specifically, it's in, the future is the actual intensity that you feel in any given present moment. Um, and it, so that means that the intensity, um, that feeling is, is actually the vibrational kind of character of vitality and actuality. Um, and this is a feeling by which we sense the future animating the present moment. So um, the intensity of the present moment is actually an index of the power of the future, the power of potentiality. 
So if there is a vibrant futurity animating matter, then we need to rethink forms of presencing um, that are not conventionally phenomenological. What does it mean to be present? Um, the present moment is more or less animated or intensified, intensified by an undecidable future. And this paper really follows the suggestion um, by arguing that digital media play a unique role in the situation, as Hansen suggests. Um, the scope of the present depends on the degree of this kind of um, digital access. So in other words, the degree of that intensity and the specificity of its affect, so whether it's joy or fear, depends on our access to this worldly technicity. So there's something at stake here. Clearly we are moving into a very strange kind of computational world. What's at stake is really significant according to Hansen's reading. Um, so this brings um, up, of course, the major issues of um, the biopolitics of this kind of what they call precognitive data. Um, and if biopolitics describes how capital saturates everyday life, health, hygiene, sexuality, learning, um, in order to control populations and to extract new value from new kinds of labor, then clearly the kind of um, experiments that I'm looking at and the kind of work I'm looking at, I think, is right. Is, needs to be examined and we need to keep this question of the biopolitics um, forefront. And Deleuze and Guattari offer, you know, again, a kind of interesting approach to this in, in terms of thinking about the molecular um, and the imperceptible and how could we think about the way in which a, a political at diverse scales um, could help us uh, not necessarily just be concerned about the control state but could actually kind of repurpose the devices in some way. So, if capitalism kind of breaks through the skin quite regularly um, and reorganizes the bounded body according to new forces and new desires, um, then the human body becomes a kind of recombinant subject and it gets engaged in all sorts of new ways of becoming. The individual is divided, repeatedly divided, replaced um, by disparate trajectories of various um, kinds of uh, individuals, what is what Deleuze calls them, instead of individuals, we become individuals, or rather we are broken up into them. Um, and these are the kinds of traits, right, and, and um, uh, tensors that get taken up by um, uh, the biosocial economy, let's say. Um, so um, the kind of global capital linkages that are going to take advantage of the EDA data have to be considered. So we are all too familiar with the threat of those who capitalize on this kind of precognitive data. And today's data industries use predictive analytics to, um, to target this operational present moment um, of neuronal labor as a means of controlling the future. So surely all this granular sensing, kind of granular sensing that I'm talking about, will lead to nothing else but more control. Um, as Settle and Lillianfield argue, it may, me may mean that we need to reject the kind of research um, that we've been discussing um, if we're going to have a kind of commitment to civic, um, legal, or ethical notions of freedom. Indeed, it's not the case, is it not the case that biosocial research of this kind is really just going to deprive us of our ability to shape our sensibility? So tentatively, my answer is, is no. Um, and um, there are two reasons that I've kind of tried to summarize based on what I've been talking about. So the EDA data is not simply the recording and storing of human bodily experience, but it's also a direct engagement and encounter with an electric worldly sensibility. So as argued above, this direct engagement is better studied by attending to the intensity and disparate speeds and dynamics of both individuation and collective <coughs> coordinated movements. And then secondly, the problem is not so much the technical accessing of biodata, but the fact that such data is is stolen to serve the control state. So EDA data is here. We need to deal with it. So with these two points in mind, we must not turn our backs on the technology, permitting such data capture, but remain vigilant um, about studying and being creative about the ways we use these kinds of plugins um, um, in our research. So, and I think I'll just sort of sum, these are some sort of summarizing comments. Um, so I guess my, the, the work I'm trying to do here is to really think about sensibility outside the human-centric notion of perception. And since perception is such a key part of learning and theories of learning, um, you know, that's the link I'm trying to make is I'm trying to kind of examine then how, what are the implications then for, for how we think about theories of learning. 
Um, if perception is part of learning, it is because of the differentiated virtual web of linked speeds um, that contract at particular junctions or events. So what seems to me to be at stake then in this EDA research is a need to rethink or sort of think beyond perception studies. Um, and this is why I'm turning to someone like Mark Hansen, um, because he treats these biosensors uh, not as part of perception, perceptual devices, but as media. And he defines media as that which, quote, operates as instruments that mediate sensibility for experiential achievement. Um, the achievement, however, is indifferent, relatively indifferent to human embodiment and might be better studied through some other climatology yet to be formulated, tracking the circulation of affect across the charged field. So the, the climatology term is a term from Galloway and Thacker um, from about 10 years ago who were thinking about this stuff and who have been continuing to think about this stuff. So rethinking the nature of presence and mediation then is crucial um, when we explore, as we explore the potential use of any such data. Um, so if the human subject is a kind of after image of subpersonal material processes of the kind of charged environment, um, what is the best way to make sense of the virtual or intensive nature of these electrical charges as they flit across the wet surfaces of our bodies? If reductive scientisms turn to biosensors like E4 to control the future, what kinds of experiments might we design to show how this intensity belongs to the learning environment, the futural learning environment? And what kind of software analytics will help us analyze EDA data as ecological? The crucial thing here is that technology is no longer a surrogate for a human faculty or capacity, but instead operates directly on the sensibility of what Hansen calls the total environment, which precedes and underlies our own corporeal phenomenal experience. The microsensors actually help us study the differentiated virtual web of linked speeds. Thus, the EDA data can actually be seen as exposing the radical exteriority of experience. The challenge is to take up the data without making it the biomarker of some essential interiority possessed only or even mostly by the individual, so as to better attend to the trans-individual nature of learning. So in conclusion, sensor data is precisely the kind of data um, that all too easily joins the accelerated flows of traits and tensors as the human organism breaks apart in advanced capitalism. For this reason, we need to find new ways of studying the material ecology of classrooms and learning environments, refusing to package sensation in terms of biomarkers of disability. New kinds of questions need to be posed by researchers, questions that can help us build more complex models of this charged environment to avoid being trapped in overly simplistic models of sim stimulus and response, of, of, um, like you know, we find in a lot of these experiments um, in the lab at MIT. And in my opinion, this is sort of all in the, in the service of ultimately um, learning how to appreciate a kind of worldly sensibility that is at stake as we live by some measure um, in a digital life. So I'll just end there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I can see you. Thank you, Liz. It's a nice soothing voice to take us through all of these uh, disturbing ideas. ideas. <laughs> I'm sure uh, I'm not the only one who is thinking about like what happens when Facebook gets a hold of the empatica. Yeah. But, um, Hopefully they come talk to you first. <laughs> uh, so we have some time for questions. Uh, anybody around? It's like a very, uh, it's a stuff that we've just been working on in this lab in Manchester. I thought I would just help with a bit of framing. So we started this by a social lab about two and a half years ago in Manchester. Um, because we're very conscious of the fact that this field is um, becoming more and more dominant in educational research, in the UK especially. Um, and so uh, my colleague Maggie McClure and I are really trying desperately to occupy some of that territory and you know, may or may not be successful in terms of uh, interfering, let's say, in, in what's going on there. But um, so you know, when I bring a paper like this, it's very much a provocation to um, invite you and, and to help me, um, actually, as I said in the end, you know, really try to begin to think about the concrete kinds of experiments and um, practices that we could 
do that would, you know, I guess, uh, reclaim some of the data. Yeah. Um, I haven't worked with it that much. I mean, I think I'm using it here in a way um, to, to help me uh, make the argument, make a certain argument around what um, the role of technology. So uh, I'm kind of trying to think about how the digital technology is not merely serving the human endeavor, but that, you know, that it it's somewhat, it, it can, I mean, a certain kind of evolution and adaptation and Simondonian notion of technology is a little bit indifferent to human interest, let's say, or human endeavor. So that's primarily, I think, the way I used it. But I think maybe your, 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 your question is really interesting because if there is a kind of fundamental indifference, you know, is there a perspective that the indifference is always um, in relation to? Um, so if we were to, theorize indifference even more broadly you know, than just indifference to human. Because if, if we say this, it's indifference to human, we're still centering the human as that, which is, it's, you know. Um, so to, to kind of imagine an even more broadly conceived indifference, um, I think it fits very nicely with the general argument I've made in terms of it being so fucking unsatisfying, right? Like this argument I've made is just like, how do we, you know, what, you know, what, is, what are humans to do? What is the role of the human? Like the last part of the paper, which I didn't present, is where lies the human? And, um, you know, like a, um, a lot of critique uh, or people might read this project as being very anti-human or against the human. And, um, you know, Mark Hansen argues quite eloquently that he, he's very interested in the human. He's, his, his agenda is all about actually the human. He comes out a little bit more of phenomenology than that's why he disagrees with Deleuze in some ways. So, um, so I think, you know, this, so the question is sort of, is such a big, difficult one. And I think I want to say yes to indifference in this, you know, I want to affirm indifference in some, you know, metaphysical way, because that's what really my argument is really all about. Um, on the other hand, this balance with um, a kind of um, recognizing the power of the human and wanting to kind of create a politics that grapples with the power of the human means that I don't simply invest in indifference. Like I, that's not all I can do. I can't just affirm indifference. I have to do something else. Bring you the uh, microphone, and I can sense that your heart rate is going up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, just uh, thank you so much, Liz. Uh, I guess when I think about design, you know, there's a moment where you might, one might take kind of a technological determinist perspective, where you know there's design and technology and there, there's some kind of agency around design and I wonder with these technologies at what point does the design of the technologies kind of become autonomous where it goes more into artificial intelligence versus a completely human controlled design over what's happening and what the kind of intention you know if mm. we might call it that so um, maybe to build on Petra's point around kind of um, whether these technologies are indifferent or ambiguous it's you know, at what point is there kind of a letting go from a design perspective that moves into more of an autonomous, machinic mm. perspective? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, a, it's a that's a really good question. Again, kind of, yeah, resonating with Petra's question, too. And I think, um, so does the question to some extent connect with contemporary um, AI that you're, are you a little bit in, interested in that? or? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think. Um, uh, 
I don't, I mean, I can't, I mean, that's just too hard a question for me to answer. I mean, I live with someone who does, you know, pretty, some pretty serious AI research at um, IBM, and, um, and I'm always really underwhelmed with their theories of learning, and, um, but, uh, and even with their ideas of autonomy. So, see, you know, we've been doing this reading group, we've been reading Gilbert Simondon's um, stuff on, and we've been talking about autonomy as, you know, Simondon argues that, um, to, to imagine that autonomy is sort of the ultimate, um, an automatic, automaticity as the um, ultimate expression of technological, um, you know, polish, let's say, um, and perfection is misguided. Um, and Simon Dahl argues really beautifully because he uses a historical perspective and he looks at the changes of, um, he tries to do a genetic kind of um, uh, study of the adaptation of technology over centuries. And uh, he, he says, you know, there's a certain point in the history of um, Western culture there, um, with technology where automaticity is valued and we see it as kind of the ultimate perfection of technology. And he argues instead that, um, that the, uh, the essence of technology is actually this kind of open machine indeterminacy that's actually in, the, in an ultimate, like if you, if you dig down and you look at technologies really carefully, you, you, know, you have to examine them very, very carefully genetically, and then you will find what the, the technical element is that's really the generative force. And um, this thing will mutate and adapt over um, decades as technologies mutate and adapt. Um, and that that element, that's, and it's the, that's the word he uses to his element, is um, harbors this kind of potentiality and this indeterminacy and uh, this virtual force. And it's really interesting because when you read Simon Dahl, you see Deleuze's you see all of the Deleuze and Guattari's terminology coming out of this book. So, so yeah, so the, but I mean, I think it, it, you know, the reason why a lot of these people are writing this way, like Mark Hansen today, is precisely because of the kind of very sophisticated, very polished computational, you know, worlds that we're entering into that involve AI and a certain kind of um, autonomy um, that we probably hoped for, imagined as being the perfection of technology. and and it probably will be something very different than that. But yeah, I hope that answers the question. It's a hard question to answer, I think, you know, it's, but I think Simon is quite an interesting philosopher to think about when, when we're trying to understand when, when technologies change and why. Thank you, that was really, really interesting. Um, I'm really interested, uh, going back to the slide about um, the little, the baby, um, with a toddler building with his mum or her oh, mum, yeah, yeah. and then the ways in that was, that was interpreted in a very kind of a linear causality about being um, happy or sad or yeah. stressed, and it it feels so patently unsatisfying because it just seems to go. Although they've got all these amazing technologies to work with, and they're putting the same old gendered mummy blaming whatever yeah. a you know as you say kind of one arrow agency on this and so I guess what I'm thinking about is what is the what are the what is the future of education of scientists of these kinds like these engineers and I know so you're a professor yeah. of STEM yeah. um, what is that how does that affect your work and the I don't know if um, if STEM if engineers do any ethics or feminist philosophy, yeah. um, but it feels to me that they probably should or we're just going to get all these amazing technologies with the same old yeah. tropes and so I wonder what you yeah, think about no, that. That's, yeah, because it's an interesting question about in, um, doing interdisciplinary work too, right? And um, yeah, when I was uh, doing my uh, a, a doctorate at, P, at University of Toronto, I, did a, I was a TA for an engineering course and it was on, it was actually the history of engineering and I remember when the, the engineering students, about you know, 300 of them, got their ethics lecture um, and had to be in the room. And I can remember exactly what was said by the engineering professor. And it was, um, engineers have learned that they can't screw Mother Nature anymore. They have to wear a condom. And um, that, was, <laughs> that was the lesson. Yeah. So, and I'm sure things have changed a lot. I mean, that was many, many, many years ago. Um, but uh, so, and to be, you know, this is interesting to me, this question very, very interesting to me because um, it depends on what scientists you're working with as to whether you can pursue the kinds of projects I'm talking about or not. So 
Um, you know, I have colleagues working with neuroscientists um, who have um, predominantly backgrounds in psychology, and these projects are just, you know, very um, much um, burdened by um, assumptions about um, sort of social political assumptions that um, are just going to be obstacles all the way through. Uh, then you have, you know, for instance, the people that I've been working with in Manchester in the computer science department are much more speculative and, in, and interested in, you know, li like literally one of the people I work with, he works on um, how to, you know, build speculative models of life. And, you know, I mean, this, he's an AI person. And if you work with people in ecology, of course, you know, you can well imagine that they would be very interested in the kinds of arguments that I'm trying to make. So, you know, depending on which departments you go to and which um, uh, backgrounds these scientists have, I think you'll find different, you know, opportunities for, um, for new projects and, of course, then and you may not find them in other departments. So I think it's, it's you know, given the, the interest in the humanities or post-humanities to look for intersections with uh, physical sciences right now, I think it's important that we think about how distinctive disciplines have really distinctive paradigma paradigmatic ways of pursuing um, ideas and research, and so it, yeah, it can, it can matter where you go. But I don't have any, um, as a st professor of STEM, uh, yeah, I, I don't have any ideas yet on how to educate, you know, those in those sciences. But. Do the next round of questioning a little bit later on. Great, thank you. Thank you. I don't think <laughs> I'm starting to sweat. I don't know if I need this. Um, <laughs> uh, thanks so much. On, on behalf of the members of the audience and the New Materiality Seminar, I'd like to present you a gift of a talking stick. And this is um, very special to our local First Nations culture in terms of. Uh, representing democracy. So when held, uh, the person is invited to speak. And uh, this particular talking stick is carved out of yellow cedar, which is also uh, part of our local culture in that uh, the yellow cedar is indigenous to the West Coast here. It was carved by Jimmy Yelton, who is uh, a local Squamish First Nation and a Seashell First Nation person. And uh, he carved this in the form of an eagle. Uh, another uh, uh, level of symbolism is that the eagle represents um, intelligence and power and uh, a connection to the creator because of how high the eagle soars, uh, said to also have foresight. So uh, thank, you. Nice. Thank, thank you so, you so much. much. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, beautiful.